Hello and welcome everyone. So welcome to lecture two in my series on microeconomics. The main focal point for this lecture is on using the production possibilities frontier model to illustrate opportunity costs, um, define and uh, discuss comparative advantage and gains from trade. So that's going to be what we're going to do. This lecture falls pretty early in a microeconomics course. Um, typically it's my second lecture as it is here. It also falls relatively early in a macroeconomics course, and so you'd see this pretty early on there as well. Usually a macroeconomics class will begin with micro, and then once you get to the supply and demand model, then the course diverges typically, uh, depending on how the school's curriculum is, into, uh, into macro. Anyway, so here we're talking about uh, microeconomics. The title is Trades, uh, Trade-Offs and Trade. So the first definition for this slide deck is models. So what's a model? Um, model is any simplified representation of reality that is used to better understand real life situations. The basic idea uh, here and why we care about this is in economics, we're trying to make our thinking as rigorous as possible. We're trying to come up with a framework or perspective uh, from which to think about different types of problems. Usually our perspective, our economic way of thinking, so to speak, is uh, based in some theory. And the theory involves applying you know, a model to new data, to a new situation. And what that model is, um, is essentially just a stripped down version of, of reality. The idea is you want to abstract away any unnecessary complicating detail and get some pretty easy to work with structure that you can then apply and zoom in on the, the things it is that you specifically care about. Uh, so therefore, I say, well, models are not meant to perfectly match the real world. Instead, we make assumptions. We simplify and we, um, we make, you know, sometimes uh, quite a few assumptions so that we get rid of anything that's kind of in the way and not completely necessary to what we're studying. Um, it's important to be really clear about what the assumptions are and what they're getting for us. I think this is something that's often overlooked in um, economics at the introductory level and, um, and uh, certainly at advanced levels. It's important when you've got a model to be clear about what the assumptions are, what they're getting for us, um, and what happens if we change them, what happens if we relax some assumptions. The reason why is the predictions you're going to get from that model, you're going to want to use to interpret reality and to you know, say what might happen if you change some particular policy, if you raise the minimum wage or, 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 or something. Um, it, whatever is the theoretical prediction depends very strongly on the assumptions that you've made in the model you're using. With different assumptions, um, you get completely different predictions, and you want to make sure that the assumptions are uh, reasonable to match what it is that you're, you're trying to accomplish. So lastly, it's important to be really clear and transparent about what the assumptions are um, and to assess critically whether they make sense or whether they're overly restrictive. Okay, so one fundamental assumption that we make is the Ceteris Paribus assumption. So this is just the other things equal assumption. It's the idea that if we're trying to determine the effect of some change on some outcome we care about, we need to be confident that that's the only thing that's going on. That's the only thing that that's the only variable that's changing in um, in our analysis. Otherwise, we can't necessarily attribute, you know, the increase of a minimum wage um, to any outcome that might be of interest to policymakers if there's a variety of other things happening. So, for instance, my example: if we want to determine the effect of a price change on quantity demanded of a particular item, we assume nothing else changes. Consumer tastes don't change, number of buyers don't change, prices of related goods don't change, consumer income, uh, and so on. All these things have to remain the same. Why? Well, because these are all things that would influence the quantity demanded. And so um, later we'll define each of these as shifters of the demand curve. These are things that are going to give us kind of a new position of the demand curve itself. Well, if we're interested in trying to figure out how much of the change in quantity we're getting is due to price, we need to be confident that all that's changing is, uh, is price, so that any change in quantity we see, we can realistically attribute to that price change. So when we do this, we're invoking the Ceteris Paribus assumption, um, and we want, to be, we want to be clear in our analysis when we're, when we're um, trying to make predictions and uh, when we want to sort of... Uh, 
get a handle on what the effect of some change might be. This is all assuming that nothing else is, uh, nothing else is changing. Okay, so our first model, the production possibilities frontier model. Uh, this is going to be a simplified version of reality. We're thinking of an economy with just two goods. So a single economy, but there's only two goods that can be possibly produced. Um, I'll name those goods, although you know this seems like a pretty strong assumption. You can, you can actually model a lot of different things with just two goods, right? So suppose um, you have some some good of interest that you're, you, you care about a lot about. So suppose it's lattes or coffee. Um, and then what's your other good? Well, it could be everything else. So then you could have a really complicated economy modeled in this simple model. Um, you know, clearly there's a trade-off in terms of like how carefully that model would actually fit. Um, but, but yeah, you can actually do kind of a lot with just two goods. Anyway, so the production possibilities frontier itself is the boundary between the combinations that can be produced given the available resources and technology. So you can think about what's going on here. If, we, if we're producing two goods, uh, we can set up a graph. We have a vertical axis. We have a horizontal axis. We'll think of the quantity that can maximally be produced as being intercepts. So if we, if we have one good, say corn, on the horizontal axis, and the other good, say cars, on the vertical axis, if we put all our resources and all our technology, all our efforts into producing corn, we'll denote that point, we'll label that point on the, on the horizontal axis, the, the inter, horizontal, horizontal intercept. If we put all of our effort into cars, for instance, that would go on the vertical axis, be the vertical intercept. Well, then we can connect those dots. And the connection is going to be the production possibilities frontier. It's going to be the boundary between uh, the combinations that can be produced given the available resources and technology. Ah, so boundary, boundary between combinations that can be produced. Well, <laughs> on the other side of that boundary, on the other side of the production possibilities frontier, are the goods that are, infe that are infeasible. They cannot be produced given current resources and current levels of technology. Okay, so um, this is uh, said enough to kind of give us a sense of what this thing is verbally. Now let's see a picture of it and let's see all the things I've said, but illustrated graphically. So for concreteness, assume the two goods in our economy are cars and corn, like I, like I said. Suppose if we use all of our resources for making cars, we can make 30 million cars. So this will be, uh, this will be one intercept. If we use all of our resources for making corn, we can make 90 million bushels of corn. The production possibilities frontier model is going to help us display this graphically. So go ahead and take a look. Okay, so here is our, uh, here is our cars access and here is our corn access and I said if we put all of our resources towards cars suppose we can make 30 million of them now there's nothing special about 30 million I could have picked 45 I could have picked three um, I just picked 30 million so we had to have some number there to make it numeric um, same thing with this 90 if we put all of our resources towards producing corn we can produce 90 million bushels there's nothing special about this. What's special is this intercept here, which is indicated, or it's the, uh, it's the outcome when all resources go towards corn and no cars are produced. And then well, what happens in the middle here? Well, this frontier, this is connecting uh, the two so, sort of polar extreme outcomes where we put all of our resources towards, towards cars or all of our resources towards corn. These dots along this line are places where we're producing a little bit of both. Okay. okay, and then this shape here can take on a wide variety of shapes. So um, what, what I use and what you'd see in a standard course is going to be a bowed production possibilities frontier or a perfectly straight line, a linear production possibilities frontier. My convention, and I would imagine similar for most classes, um, if you are given some information and you have to draw a production possibilities frontier, Unless you're told otherwise, I would draw it with a straight line, actually, not as a bowed production possibilities frontier. Um, that's probably that's um, that's because you're probably going to use this model then to calculate comparative advantage, and that, that's a lot easier to do in a linear model. So, um, anyhow. All right. So um, earlier I talked about what lies beyond, what's past the boundary of the production possibilities frontier. Those were infeasible bundles. So, right, so we can illustrate feasible and infeasible combinations of goods that can be produced by our economy. 
the PPF, Production Possibilities Frontier, displays the limits to production, and separates the feasible combinations from infeasible. So combinations lying on or inside the Production Possibilities Frontier are feasible, those lying closer to the origin, and the combinations lying beyond the Production Possibilities Frontier are infeasible. Those cannot be attained with the current level of resources and technology. Okay, so here's just the verbal definition. I'll, I'll illustrate this with the graph now. So here was our familiar production possibilities frontier. We had our endpoints. Um, I only labeled some bundles. I labeled uh, this one in red. I labeled this one in red. And then I said the red combinations, those are feasible or attainable bundles. The ones that I've labeled in blue here, these are infeasible or unattainable bundles. These are those lying beyond the production possibilities frontier. And, you know, actually there's sort of infinitely many production combinations that lie closer to the origin here, and there's infinitely many that lie beyond. I just picked a couple to illustrate. Okay. So uh, we can sort of introduce a, our, our first pass at a, at a concept of uh, efficiency. So if the economy is efficient, this means it's getting all it can from the resources and technology available. So um, that, this is where there's nothing going to waste. Bundles that lie exactly on the production possibilities frontier are said to be efficient. Efficient. So those are the ones where we are using up all of our resources. There's nothing left over. Bundles that lie inside the production possibilities frontier are inefficient. So these represent uh, situations where we've left something on the table, right? So we've produced some amount of corn and cars, for instance, uh, but we have some unused, some unused resources that could be put towards one or the other without causing us to sacrifice or give up um, any, of the, any, of the, any of the good we're currently consuming. Okay, so um, that's my point right here. I said the economy can move from a point inside the production possibilities frontier to a point on the production possibilities frontier without having to give up any uh, of either good. So once again, we'll go ahead and see this with the, with the graph. Um, oh, a couple slides, I guess. Maybe it's the very next slide, sorry. So um, a trade-off is required if we're trying to move from one point on the production possibilities frontier to another point that's also on the production possibilities frontier. And the reason why, well, remember the PPF, those are our efficient bundles. Those are situations where we're already making the most of our resources. So there's no resources that are sitting idle. There's nothing that's been unused. So in order to get more of one good, you've got to be willing to give up some of the other. Right? So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Okay, so here's the picture. So I've got a couple different bundles. Bundle A, this is an inefficient um, but feasible bundle. B and C are efficient feasible bundles. And D is an infeasible bundle. Economy cannot reach point D. Okay. So the economy can go from point A to point B, or, I mean, actually, arguably, to point C. Well, not to point C. Point C is uh, actually, uh, if we, so point, we could go from point A straight up to point B. We could go from point A uh, straight over to the production possibilities frontier, all without incurring a trade-off, right? So the idea is that if we're right here, we've got some current production of corn, and we decide that we want to get um, we decide that we want to get more cars, we can get more cars. We can go from bundle A to, you know, well, actually just a little bit to the right of bundle B, I guess my picture is not perfect, uh, without incurring any trade-offs, right? So the reason why is because going from A to B, we have unused resources. On the other hand, going from point C to point B, you know, point C is already efficient. All of our resources, resources are already put to use. If we want to get to point B, we want to get a lot more cars, that's going to cost us. It's going to cost us some corn, right? So that's going to be a trade-off there. Okay, we can actually quantify, we can measure this trade-off in terms of opportunity costs. So that's going to be the next thing we do. Okay, so choices that involve trade-offs also involve opportunity costs. The opportunity costs, remember, opportunity costs are what's, what's given up, what's sacrificed. So the, val the, the value um, that, that you lose when choosing otherwise, right? So it's the value of your next highest alternative. So with opportunity costs, we're always thinking of what we have given up. Okay, so the opportunity cost of a car is the number of bushels of corn foregone to get an additional car. And all that means is the opportunity cost of cars is how many corn, how much corn we have to give up to get that additional car. 
so computationally, it'd be the number of corn foregone divided by the number of cars gained, right? So, um, so we, we, the opportunity cost of uh, cars in terms of corn, we take how much corn have we lost divided by how much cars have we gained. So, um, typically we want to see this boiled down to the opportunity cost of one car, right? So that would be the number of bushels of corn we have to give up for one car. Uh, note that our production possibilities frontier is bowed outward. This means the opportunity cost of a car increases as the quantity produced increases. Um, so this is actually best just seen illustrated. So take a look at a couple bundles I've labeled here. We have bundle A, which involves, yeah, it looks like about 20 million cars and 50 million corn. Bundle B involves 30 million corn and 29 million cars. And then going from bundle B to bundle C, this is 30 million cars and zero corn. Okay, so one of the things we recognize is if we go from A to B or B to C, in each case, we're gaining an additional car. Right? So for, for, for this move from A to B and then B to C, um, so from A to B, we gain an additional car. And then from B to C, we gain an additional car. Or, I mean, million cars. Okay, right. So... Um, but the opportunity cost, the cost in terms of corn, that's not constant. So that one car, or those one million cars going from A to B, that cost us 20 million bushels of corn. But that same additional million cars cost us 30 million bushels of corn going from B to C. So if we want a bundle that involves 29 million cars and 30 million bushels of corn, we can do that. But if we want to go then to get a, a bundle that involves only cars, 30 million cars, we have to give up 30 million bushels of corn. So we have a, the opportunity cost is non-constant. The opportunity cost is changing as we're, uh, as, as we're changing the bundle of current production. Okay, so uh, here I write this out for us now to sort of interpret what the graph is saying. So the opportunity cost of 1 million cars in terms of corn depends on where the economy is currently at. So how much, how many cars and how much corn do we already have? So this is just reminding us of what point A, point B, point C had. And then, right, going from point A to B, the opportunity cost of 1 million cars was 20 million bushels of corn. Uh, but we have a boat production possibilities frontier. So we have a different opportunity cost going from B to C. Opportunity cost of 1 million cars is now 30 million bushels of corn. So that was just illustrating the preceding slide, the graph there. So one last thing about opportunity cost. The opportunity cost is a ratio. So the opportunity cost of a car in millions is the ratio of bushels of corn foregone to cars gained. The opportunity cost of a bushel of corn is the ratio of cars foregone to, the bushel of, to, to bushels of corn gained. These are reciprocals, right? So the opportunity cost of a bushel of corn is equal to the inverse of the opportunity cost of a car. So we'll return to this slide a little, this, return to this idea a little bit later on. Um, but it's important to know if you have the opportunity cost of cars in terms of corn, you also have the opportunity cost of corn in terms of cars at that current bundle of production. Um, and if you had a linear production possibilities frontier, then it would be, it'd be constant. So then uh, you wouldn't have to do any further calculations. Okay, so uh, now just a couple more facts about thinking about the production possibilities frontier model before we move on to an application. So first, we can represent technological advancement. This would be shown by the expansion of the production possibilities frontier in the direction uh, corresponding to a single good. So suppose we have a situation where one good can be produced more efficiently than prior, or we have new resources that are now available. Well, we would do this, we represent this graphically by shifting out the intercept on the respective axis. Now, suppose we have something that affects the economy as a whole. So we have technological change in all industries or whatever. Uh, so this would, be this would be economic growth. This would be represented by a rightward shift to the production possibilities frontier. So this would be a situation where we can produce more good, or both goods more efficiently and get more of both goods. Right? So we shift out the production possibilities frontier. And yeah, you could have the reverse. So you could have a loss of technology and then you shift inward or you could have um, economic contraction. So like, like a, a decrease in the, um, 
in the maximal long run aggregate supply. So then you'd to be sort of disastrous and you could shift the production possibilities frontier inward. Okay, but we're gonna demonstrate the more the more happy outcome. So suppose, you know, we're producing cars, suppose a new factory um, has been created or we have better existing technologies. So, or better technologies, uh, better factories that make our, ex or better technology to make our existing factories more efficient. So what, what would this do? This would increase our maximal productivity of cars without affecting corn, right? So if our factories are better, or if we have more factories, it's going to help us make more cars. It's not going to affect our production of corn. So if we put all of our resources into cars because of this, these better factories, we expect to get more cars out of the existing resources. That shouldn't help us get more corn if we're putting everything into corn. Now, that said, look what's happened to this original production possibilities frontier. All the points that are on this original production possibilities frontier, except for this one, are rendered inefficient when we have this technological change, right? So the point right here, it would have previously been efficient, but after the technological change, it's now inefficient. What that means is we could move uh, to the frontier and be able to get more without requiring a trade-off. So this is going to actually indirectly help us get more corn because we can free up resources that are no longer needed to make a particular level of cars um, and we can, we're can we able to get more of both. So technological change should affect just one good but sort of indirectly it can help us get more of the other and that's why you see that you know um, there's this sort of wide gap that's sort of shrinking as we get down to the situation where we're putting all of our resources towards corn. Reason why is that yeah the better factories let us get more ca our cars when, we, when that's what we're primarily trying to do. If we're putting all of our resources towards corn, those better factories don't help us at all. And if we're somewhere in the middle, those better factories can let us get more cars, sure enough, but it could also help us make the same amount of cars uh, with fewer resources. So we have more workers and you know, more other um, you know, materials to put towards producing our other products. Okay. And then we have economic growth. So here's a situation where we have something that's affected the production of both goods. So we can get more of both. Okay. All right, so um, now we're, into, we're ready to introduce our example, to think about applying these ideas and seeing some gains from trade. So we need some terminology. The first one is absolute advantage. We say a person or country has an absolute advantage if that trader is more productive than another. We'll contrast this, or this is sort of related to, it's not contrast necessarily, uh, comparative advantage. So a person has a comparative advantage or a firm has a comparative advantage if that trader is able to perform production at a lower opportunity cost than anyone else. Okay, so in order to, in order to determine who has a comparative advantage, we must calculate opportunity costs. And then it, whichever opportunity cost is lower, um, Whichever trader has a lower opportunity cost for producing that particular good uh, has the comparative advantage. And if you have a comparative advantage in a particular good, you know you might as well specialize in that good. Uh, you'd literally be wasting your time producing the other good. So we'll build it. We'll build on that intuition. That's sort of the point of this example. All right. So absolute advantage versus comparative advantage. Absolute advantage is about productivity. So how many resources does it take to produce a particular good or service? That's a question about productivity. Now, comparative advantage is about opportunity cost. So this is how much of some other good are you giving up to produce a unit of the good or service that we're focusing on? Right. So whoever gives up the least to be able to produce cars ought to produce cars. And whoever gives up the least in terms of cars to produce corn ought to produce corn. So traders should specialize according to comparative advantage. And let's go ahead and, and develop this intuition. Okay, so I've got two characters, Jack and Max, who can both create drawings and Lego houses. So we have Jack's productivity. He can either make a drawing or a Lego house every two minutes. Uh, if Jack spends all his time drawing pictures, he can produce 30 in an hour. If Jack spends all his time building Lego houses, he can produce 30 in an hour. Um, if he's if he splits his time evenly, he can produce 15 drawings and 15 Lego houses in an hour. Okay, so what I've done is I've 
given you um, Jack's productivity. And in a lot of cases, in these sort of gains from trade models or opportunity cost illustrated by production possibilities frontier model uh, cases, you might be given outputs. You might be given their actual production of your, of your two traders. Uh, in that case, you just calculate opportunity cost in a relatively straightforward fashion. Well, here, I give you not their actual output directly. First, I give you their production, their, pro their productivity. So I say, um, I, I say like, um, uh, how many per hour Jack can spend? Um, or I, or originally, I say Jack can make either a drawing or a Lego house every two minutes. So that's his productivity. Uh, now we have to specify a time period, usually an hour, and this allows us to calculate his output. So now I can calculate, oh, 30 is his output per hour, right? So you could you could be given the productivity, so um, every two minutes, um, how the rate at which they're able to produce the two goods. Um, and if that's all you have, you cannot calculate opportunity cost directly just from the, the productivities. You have to specify a time period and figure out how much output they can produce. So um, that's that might be difficult to appreciate just uh, at, at the moment, but it's important to kind of say going forward that there's a sort of important distinction. Whenever we're doing one of these problems, you want to make sure we're working with outputs. And if you have not been given outputs, suppose you've been given a productivity, you need to convert this to an output. So in other words, it's sort of a non-trivial step here, <laughs> going from item one to item two and three. That's really important. Very often on a test question, maybe you'd only have item one and you'd have to do item two and three yourself. Um, other, what happens other, otherwise your results are exactly reversed. They're exactly reversed of what they should be. So anyway, so um, right, so Jack's opportunity cost of producing one drawing is one Lego house. Opportunity cost phrase in terms of output. So his opportunity cost of producing one drawing is one Lego house. Well, that's natural, right? So he can make either a drawing or a Lego house every two minutes. Um, he can make 30 in an hour. Um, if he spends all his time building a Lego house, he get 30. If he spends all his time making draw or drawing pictures, he can get 30. If he splits his time evenly, he can produce 15 of 15 of each. Yeah. So he, if he every time he produces a drawing, he's given up the same block of time that he could have been using to make houses, right? Okay. So Jack's opportunity cost of producing one drawing is one Lego house, and because opportunity costs are reciprocals. We, um, for the other good, we know his opportunity cost of producing one Lego house is also one drawing. Okay. What about Max? So Max is younger. He's not as good at building. He's pretty good at scribbling. So if Max uses all his, times to make, all his time to make drawings, he can make 30 in an hour. That matches Jack's. If he uses all his time to build Lego houses, he can make six in an hour. So he's not as good as, at building Lego houses um, as, as Jack. Uh, in, phrased in terms of productivities, uh, he can make a drawing every two minutes, or he can make a house every ten minutes. Okay, so you know clearly his opportunity cost um, of each of the goods is not going to be the same because there's a different time requirement for each, and he can produce a different number in an hour. Okay, so think about what this is going to be, and I'll show you in just a second. Okay, so um, for each additional house. Max makes, he has to decrease his drawing production by five. Every time he makes a house that eats up 10 minutes, he could have made, uh, it takes him two minutes to make a drawing, so he could have used those five two minute blocks, those 10 minutes, he could have used those to make five drawings, right? So for every house he makes, Max must decrease his drawing production by five. For every additional drawing he makes, Max must decrease his Lego house production by one fifth. Oh, well, this is exactly opportunity cost, right? So Max's opportunity cost of producing one drawing is one-fifth a Lego house. And Max's opportunity cost of producing one Lego house is five drawings. So we can actually compare their production possibility frontiers for these two, uh, these two characters, assuming they each have uh, one hour av available. Okay, so we're, we're going to give each their own graph. So you're not gonna, you could draw the two production possibilities frontier, uh, frontiers on the same graph that can get a little confusing. I, I like to draw them separately. So, okay, so both can produce the same number of drawings, 30 per hour. So our drawing intercept is going to be the same for both. Jack can produce 30 Lego houses. So Jack's Lego house intercept is going to be 30, which tells us 
hey, the production possibilities frontier, um, that's going to have a slope of 1. Well, we knew this already because the opportunity cost um, is, is exactly the slope of the production possibilities frontier. Okay, so what about Max? Max can only produce six Lego houses. So if we make, um, so on the Lego axis, our Lego intercept is going to be at six. It's going to be um, a point closer to the origin than Jack's for sure. So if we had drawings on the vertical and houses on the horizontal, uh, we'd have a steeper um, production possibilities frontier for Max. Um, and I see I did this the other way. <laughs> so um, suppose you want to have drawings on the horizontal and you want to have houses on the vertical. What do we have then? Well, Max's uh, vertical intercept for houses isn't going to go as high as Jack's. So he's going to have a flatter production possibilities frontier. Okay. Okay, so we, all right, so I explained it two ways. Does it, does it matter which one is your intercept? Well, no, unless you're told, right? If you're told specifically use one as your intercept or the other, um, then otherwise you're, you're free to make either good, either intercept. Um, and you'll see in a second, it really doesn't matter. We get the same opportunity costs whether, um, whether we uh, change the orientation of the axes or, or not. Okay, so Jack's opportunity cost of one, uh, of one drawing is one Lego house. Right? We could have phrased this differently. Right? We could have had drawings up here and houses down here. And in that case, we would say the reverse. We'd say Jack's opportunity cost of one house is one drawing. Okay, so, but with houses on the vertical axis and drawings on the horizontal axis, Jack's opportunity cost of one drawing is one Lego house. How do we know this? Well, um, if we start over here and we move rightward, for every additional drawing Jack gets, he's got to give up one Lego house. Right, so that's the slope. All right, same thing for Max. So Lego houses on the vertical. Max's opportunity cost of one drawing is one fifth a Lego house, right? So if we move if we move over to um, if we move over one drawing, we go down uh, one fifth a Lego house. Uh, if we go down uh, if we go down one Lego house, we can move over uh, what five five drawings. All right, so suppose for the sake of the example, each one has an hour available, decides to do the following. So Jack spends the hour making 15 drawings and 15 Lego houses. Max spends his hour making five drawings and five Lego houses. Check. This does exhaust their, uh, their, their time. This is an efficient bundle, so both of these are going to lie on the production possibilities frontier. Matter of fact, it's at the midpoint of the two production possibilities frontiers. Okay, so let's place their current production plans on their PPFs. Got it. Okay, so 15, 15, 5, 5. Cool. All right. Uh, now, let's reflect on the fact that Jack is more productive, all things considered. Um, we get a total of 20 total drawings and 20 total houses. So... Um, 15 from Jack, 5 from Max, 15 from Jack, 5 from Max. Jack produces three times as much of both goods as Max, right? Jack produces 15 of each good, Max produces 5. Jack has the absolute advantage in both goods, actually. Jack's more efficient in both goods. What about comparative advantage? So for this, we have to compare opportunity costs. Uh, so here's a, here's a question, sort of is a little bit of a puzzle at this point. Um, can Jack and Max gain from trading? Do they both gain? Does only one gain? Can Jack gain? I mean, Jack, Jack's got the absolute advantage in both goods. Does it make any sense to trade with Max? Well, it does. And the reason is, when we're thinking about gains from trade, and we're thinking about specialization, that's actually, that's actually a term that we determine, that's a, so, something we determine based off of comparative advantage, not off of absolute advantage. So a trader that has an absolute advantage in both goods still benefits from trade um, if it's the case that they have a comparative advantage in one good and the other person has a comparative advantage in the other good. All right, so let's see that illustrated. Comparing opportunity costs. So Jack's opportunity cost of one drawing is one Lego house. Jack's opportunity cost of one Lego house is one drawing. Max's opportunity cost of producing one drawing is one-fifth Lego houses. It's opportunity cost of producing one Lego house is five drawings. 
So Jack clearly has the lowest opportunity cost um, in, in producing houses. Right? It costs Jack one drawing to make a house, but it costs Max five drawings. Right? Max has the comparative advantage in drawing. Max has a lower opportunity cost in drawing. It costs, it, when Max makes a drawing, it costs him one Lego, one fifth Lego house, one fifth Lego house for every drawing. For Jack, when he makes a drawing, it costs him one Lego house. And here I'm talking about costs. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean by this is when Jack spends his time, his, his resource for making drawings, he loses the ability to, to apply that time to make Lego houses. So it costs him. It's his opportunity cost. When Jack makes a drawing with that time, that's time he cannot use for making a Lego house. And he actually loses exactly one Lego house when he spends the time he would have used for houses instead drawing. Well, what about Max? The story's a little bit different. With that same time that Max could use to, uh, to make a drawing, he could only make one-fifth a Lego house. So his cost, in terms of the value of his time used for the other good, is so much less than for than for um, in, for drawing. Uh, he gives up so much, so much, so many fewer houses uh, when he makes a drawing than does Jack. Like Max is compared to Jack, Max is literally wasting his time if he if he makes a Lego house because he loses so many drawings. Um, okay, so uh, right. So to maximize joint production, then Jack should specialize in building and Max in drawing. So. If both specialize, we get the following result. So Jack produces 30 Lego houses, no drawings. Max produces 30 drawings, no Lego houses. Um, jointly, their economy is more productive now. I mean, remember, when they each produced an equal amount of both, Jack was 15 and 15 houses and drawings, Max was 5 and 5, we had 20 of each. Now we've got 30 of each. So that's sort of the beauty of specialization, right? So neither person is wasting their time making the other product. Instead, they've been the most efficient. Um, that said, now each only has one thing. Jack only has houses. Max only has drawings. So what if each wants some of both good? Well, now they can trade. So mutually beneficial trade occurs at a price that lies between the trader's opportunity costs. And the idea here is that it's got to be cheaper to buy the good from the other person than to make it themselves. So suppose Jack sells 10 houses to Max in exchange for 20 drawings. Uh, now, after the trade that sends 10 houses to Max and 20 drawings to Jack, Jack has 20 houses, produced 30 minus 10. Jack has 20 drawings. He produced 0, received 20 from Max. Max gets 10 houses. He had produced 0, but gets 10 from Jack. Uh, Max has 10 drawings. He had produced 30, but he loses 20 to Jack. Note. Each one ends up with five more units of each good relative to the original scenario where they split their time evenly between the two goods, right? So previously, Jack would have had 15 and 15 and Max 5 and 5. Now each has five more of both goods, right? So there's gains from trade. Um, here's the initial case. This is actually just sort of a little bit of a benchmark. What was really interesting is by specialization, Jack gets 30 houses, Max gets... Uh, 30 drawings. That's not so good if you actually want to consume a little bit of both. Instead, they trade, and the bundle that I found where, they, uh, where they're trading, uh, Max gets 10 of each, and Jack gets 10 of each. Now, it wouldn't have to be the case that they produce, uh, that they trade for a symmetric bundle, right? There's a lot of different bundles they could have traded to, uh, to obtain, um, but this is just one to, to illustrate really nicely. And look at the point here. Both are able to consume a bundle that they could not have produced themselves, right? This bundle lies beyond the production possibilities frontier. They're able to consume a bundle they could not have produced themselves. This is the beauty of trade, right? This is exactly, this is like a, a, a fundamental sort of cool insight from economics. We can see this in the second lecture, right? This is really cool. Okay, so. Uh, right, so this is a crucially important result. Specialization according to comparative advantage, followed by mutually agreeable trade, gave us a situation where both traders are made better off, um, in the sense that both is able to consume a bundle they could not have possibly produced alone. Okay, I want to go back to one thing. I said um, the mutually beneficial trade occurs at a price that lies between the trader's opportunity costs. So 
it needs to be the case that the price of the good when you're trading with the other person has to be less than the price of the good in terms of your own opportunity cost, right? Think about like how much it costs you um, to use some of your time uh, for one good instead of the other. Think about like how much of the, the other good you're giving up. If you're able to give up less, if, if it costs you less to buy it from the other person than it would be to produce it yourself, then we have mutually agreeable trade, right? And we can always find prices, assuming, assuming each has a comparative advantage in the opposite goods, um, then we can always find a mutually beneficial price lying between their respective opportunity costs. Uh, one more comment about comparative advantage. Um, it is possible to have the absolute advantage in both goods. Uh, it is not possible to have the comparative advantage in both goods. You can have the comparative advantage in at most one good. So what I was saying before, if a trader has a comparative, if one, one trader has a comparative advantage in one good and the other has a comparative advantage in the other good, then we can come up with mutually agreeable trade. The uh, example I was sort of contrasting that with in my mind is suppose you have a situation where no one has a comparative advantage, right? So you're either, in any example, you're either going to have a situation where one has a comparative advantage in one good, one has a comparative advantage in the other good, or you'll have a situation where no one has a comparative advantage. In, in that case, it's sort of the rare case where there's no gains from trade. So, okay. All right, very good. So go ahead and conclude here, follow up doing, doing the reading, and... Um, try to reinforce the definitions that you've seen me illustrate here um, when, you're, when you're doing the reading. Look and see, just as I've applied definitions with these graphs, look and see how, how, you're, uh, um, how this is done in the, in the text as well. Okay.